Hello guys, David Vos here. Well, it's a beautiful day where I'm at here in uh, New Mexico, and I hope you're having a beautiful and wonderful day where you're at. Today, guys, I want to talk to you about something that um, is pretty important, pretty amazing. Uh, we've talked a, a little bit about some of this, but I want to go into this today from the point of view of Zechariah chapter 5. And Zechariah chapter 5 is a little known parabolic prophecy. It's pretty kind of weird, you know, kind of like the, the dragon and the beast, one of Revelation, and the woman clothed with the sun, and, you know, or, or the two witnesses. I mean, probably the most favorite prophetic vision that we go over and over and over and over is there in Revelation, probably 11, Revelation 11, 12, and 13. And of course, it's about the beast and the false prophet and the latter days and the tribulation, all that we are so concerned with in these days. But starting with chapter 11 of Revelation, you see these two witnesses and they're symbolized by two candlesticks and two olive trees and and you know, you know the whole spiel the 1260 days but most of you probably know or some of you know that this starts this prophecy of revelation 11 and the two witnesses is elsewhere almost i wouldn't say it's identical but it's very closely relayed to us in Zechariah chapter 4. And there it calls it the two anointed ones, and it gives you the same two olive trees and all of that. And we're not going to go too much into that, but I just want you to, to realize where we're, we're at here. We're talking about this particular prophecy that obviously has to do with the Great Tribulation and something very important for Christians today. Now, there have been countless books written on this and the beast and the false prophet and the woman and the four horses and all that. But Zechariah has another little scene that we don't get evidently in the book of Revelation. And it's about this woman whose name is Wickedness. Now, we do get the woman who's writing the beast in Revelation but it's unlike that. It it it. But it, it it is the same woman. But it's unlike that, and people really don't know, or they're not in unison as to what all of this means. And almost nobody ever writes about Zechariah chapter five and tries to explain it. They just don't even know what it means. And in spite of the fact that they don't really know what it means the commentators have usually guessed pretty well. But there's a couple of points in here that they haven't been able to figure out or the the, the, the total real meaning of, of that as well as the meaning of any of the book of Revelation. Because, for instance, we were talking about in other videos, we were talking about how I've come to understand that the woman is known as the mother of harlots and on her forehead is written a name. Babylon the Great. So, people then assume that, well, this woman is Babylon. And, of course, since Babylon was a kingdom as well as a city, they assume it's the city, Babylon. Because it says that she's a great city that has a kingdom over the kings of the earth. So it's a city, but she, and she dwells upon seven mountains, and she sits as a queen, and she says, I am no widow, and I will see no sorrow. <laughs> if you read the first part of Revelation 18, where it talks about her a lot, you get the impression that they're talking about the world rulers of today. They really think they're deity. They think they can do whatever they want to us. And that they are reigning over us and we're their slaves and ain't nothing we can do about it. And that's 
exactly what this group is that we're going to show you who rules over us and what this is talking about, who this mother of the harvest really is. But it says that this beast, which has ten horns, will the ten horns will will kill the harlot and burn her with fire. Now, I've said in the last, I don't know how many videos we've been talking about this, I've been telling you guys that this is not actually Babylon, but it's Jerusalem. And it refers to, to Jerusalem, who is the mother of the harlots, and we are going to show that that is true, but it's not perhaps actually even about an actual city. But a woman or a city means a political thing. That's what a city or uh, opolis, which is the policies. That's what the word, the root of that word is policy or the, or the rule. And it's not a kingdom. You don't normally have cities if you don't have a kingdom. But it is a symbolic city and it reigns over the kings of the earth. And because it's a woman, we understand that it's a policy or a rule that is a, is a covenant with Yahweh. It has a covenant with Yahweh and that's, called, that's why it's called an idolatrous whore because she's supposed to be obedient and submissive to her husband Yahweh do everything he says. But she isn't. And so, therefore, she's called wickedness in the prophecy here. And Yahweh says, I'm going to destroy you. But in the end, I'm going to restore you. But you're going to spend all this time, you know, being exiled. But you're going to still, even while you're exiled, in your arrogancy, you're going to say, I sit as a queen. I'm, I'm reigning over the world. But, you know, they don't even have their own kingdom. Think about that. They're reigning over the world, over the kings of the earth. But they don't have a kingdom. But they're riding the kingdom or the beast. Now, who do you suppose that would be? We'll see here in just a minute. And we've been saying that our proof for that primarily comes from Hosea chapter 5 and 6, where there is the mother of the harlots spoken of there as Jerusalem. And the, 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 the daughters is Judea and, and Samaria. So the northern and the southern tribes they went into the world and they were sent into the world as captives. And so most of the biblical prophecy is talking about this Jerusalem that would then be destroyed and then exiled into the world. And there would be these two groups, the northern tribes of Israel, that's called Israel, and the southern tribes, which is called Judea. And they, they would then take on two identities. They were no longer basically the same group, just the one whole Israel. But they would split and become two daughters. Now, as far as why this woman now is called Babylon the Great, a mystery, Babylon the Great, we have speculated. But I'm going to show you today a little bit more reason why we know that this is true. And why the Bible is saying that she's the mother of the harlots and she has this mystery Babylon on her head. Because many have said, well, this must be Rome because the woman sits on seven mountains and they say, well, Jerusalem sits on seven mountains. Well, you know, it's debatable, but people have said that. I don't know if it's a real thing. Babylon was supposed to have sat on seven mountains and so was Rome. I don't know. I've heard other people say that Constantinople and other towns set on seven mountains. So I don't know if we could use that, ex you know, exclusively as an identification, especially since the prophecy says the seven mountains mean seven kingdoms. So it's not seven mountains in one kingdom, but it's seven mountains in seven different kingdoms. And she reigns over the kings of the earth. So while there may be seven mountains, literally, and then symbolically, there are seven kingdoms. Whatever this city or policy is that reigns and, you know, guides the beast, reigns with a rein, or you put reins on a horse, right? So she, that's why you reign. <laughs> that's probably where it came from. She reigns over the world. 
and the seven mountains are all the mountains cyclically from the beginning to the end of time. That's what seven represents, like in a week until the rest or until it's finished. We know that also because it says five have fallen, one is, the other's yet to come, and the eighth is the one who was but is not and shall ascend, and so we can see that it's cyclical. And of course, eight has to do with the infinite of the cycle. It just keeps coming and, and cycling forever and ever. Eight to figure eight. But we're going to be able to identify her here today. Absolute clarity. So, Zechariah, we said in chapter five, has a, an aspect of this entire prophecy we find in Revelation. Wedged in between the two witnesses are the two anointed ones and the four horsemen that go forth and ride in book of revelation and all the 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 wickedness that is goes forth into the earth and this abominations and all of these things and i want to read to you real quickly a part of this so because a lot of you may not even be familiar with zachariah chapter five now the first part from one to Four is just about he turns and he lifts up his eyes and he sees a flying roll and he said to me what seest thou and I answered I see a flying roll the length thereof is 20 cubits the breadth is, is thereof is 10 cubits then he said unto me this is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth for everyone that stealeth shall be cut off as on this side according to it and everyone that sweareth shall be cut off as on that side according to it. A curse? Huh? Whoever stealeth? So if you steal, you're cursed. Because, as the Apostle Paul said, the law was a bondage and a curse. And we're all under the curse. And Yahweh cursed them and drove them out of the garden. And the entire law of Moses is the curse. Whoever steals, whoever speaks falsely or whatever it is that you do wrong according to the book or the scroll. And now we know a little bit about, a little bit more about what this woman is, this covenant. It's the covenant of a curse. Because you're going to be cursed because of this scroll or this book or this Torah. And it's going to go not just there at Jerusalem, but it's going to be taken up on the wings of the stork, and the whole world shall be under her reign, under the curse. And I will bring it forth, saith Yahweh, of armies of war. And it shall enter into the house of the thief, into the house of him that sweareth falsely. And so this is, this is not something we want to dig down deep about. But the only point that I want to make here is that we're talking about something that happens whereby a curse goes forth to the entire world. And it, it starts here in Zechariah with the idea that Jerusalem has sinned and they're going to go into exile. And when they go into exile, there is going to be prophecies of terrible things going on in the world. But verse 5, it gets a little bit more particular. It says in verse 5, then the angel that talked with me went forth and said to me, Lift up now thine eyes, and see what is this that goeth forth. And I said, What is it? And he said, This is the ephah that goeth forth. He said, Moreover, this is their resemblance through all the earth. And behold, there was lifted up a talent of lead. And this is a woman that sitteth in the midst of the ephah. And he said, This is wickedness. And he cast it into the midst of the ephah, and he cast the weight of lead upon the mouth thereof. Then lifted I up mine eyes and looked and beheld. There came out two women. And the wind was in their wings, for they had the wings like the wings of a stork. And they lifted up the ephah between the earth and the heaven. Then said I unto the angel that talked with me, Whither doth these bear the ephah? And he said unto me, To build it an house in the land of Shinar and it shall be established and set there upon her base. Now, I've heard people look at this and try to come up with explanations. 
Because the first thing that people think of when they see this woman and her name is wickedness, it's very obvious from the text that Zechariah is talking about Jerusalem and she's going to be scattered like into all the winds of heaven and go into the world as an, in an exile. And that Jerusalem had, had become defiled, the holy temple, which is the very center of their worship in the center of their temple was, was defiled. And so the woman is usually in, co- in prophecy. A woman is a covenant. A man makes a covenant with a woman. And this is what the Old Testament law of Yahweh was, was a covenant. And it was Yahweh marrying Israel. And, and so the nation was his wife. So almost ex- down the line, all of the scholars say that the woman is Israel or Jerusalem, I should say. But very few people understand why now there are two women and the ephah is a measure i guess like a bushel uh, so a little more than a bushel or something like that um what it, it, it's it's weird how the bible will use these symbols and for us today we might be looking at something that we don't even understand. We don't use an ephah. We're not quite sure about it. Christians hear the word ephah all the time, and they're like, oh yeah, the ephah. But they don't know what they're talking about. They don't know what it means. The commentators will say that she's thrown, the woman is thrown into the ephah, and therefore it's not full. It's a measure of corn. I guess what you would say like a, a basket that would measure an ephah. Now, I don't know how big this ephah is, but the woman, supposedly, according to the commentators, or is thrown into the basket, shall we say. And if she was thrown in there, they say, well, then it wasn't full. And so the connotation here is that when the measure is full, her iniquity is full. And so the measure of ephah is not, is not wickedness. It's the woman who is wickedness. And She's thrown into the measure, I guess to symbolize the measure of her wickedness, perhaps because she wasn't dealing correct with the measures. But when this measure is full, they put a lead, now why lead? A a lead lid, a lead lid. Because evidently if you've got a really heavy lid, you can't get out. So here's the woman stuck in this basket. And it's filling up. And when it's full, she's done. So in verse 7, it says that the woman sitteth in the midst of the ephah. So she's sitting in a basket. And this is wickedness. And he cast it into the midst of the ephah. Well, there's nothing there. There's no it other than the woman. And the word it that's translated it is her, should be translated her. It's feminine. So it's the woman that's thrown into the ephah. And then they cast the weight of lead upon the mouth thereof. So evidently she can't get out. Then I lifted up mine eyes and looked and behold, there came out two women. So once you've gotten rid of the Jerusalem and Judea and Israel are scattered, now you've got the two women. And there's why Hosea says there's the mother of the harlots and then there are two harlots. And so, here's the interesting thing. If the the two women are taking the basket up into the air between the heavens and the earth, and then they're going to come down into a land of Shinar and build her house, and it will be established and set there upon her own base. Build her house? Well, we got two women now. That should be hers, right? Plural. No, because the woman's in the basket. The other two women are carrying her. Her two daughters are carrying her covenant between heaven and earth, and they're going to land in the land of Shinar and make a house for her. That's Jerusalem, or the covenant with Yahweh. So the covenant of Yahweh is just one woman and that covenant is going to have a new house, not there in Jerusalem anymore, but in Shinar, in Babylon. 
This is what baffles scholars because Jerusalem, they think, was never rebuilt or no temple was built for the mother of the harlots, Jerusalem, in Babylon. So what is it talking about? And what are these two women? They can't figure it out. Well, I've just explained what the two women are. But why is the woman going to have a house built for her in Shinar? Well, Shinar is where Babel or Babylon was originally, you know, the, 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 where the nations began. The rabbis say that when Yahweh confused the languages at Babel, all the world scattered from there. So, what temple could have been built in Shinar? Now, I've heard people say, well, the only explanation is this is talking about Mecca and they got this square rock idol of some kind of thing that they all bow down and worship. It's on a pedestal. And the actual translation here is that she'll be established on her own base. Could be translated a pedestal. And so some say this is talking about Mecca. So, so some people say this is talking about Mecca and this is the false religion that came of it. But that makes no sense because the Muslim religion, though they do believe in the Ten Commandments and Moses, it wouldn't make any sense that they're one of these women that was dropped there and they started a religion. And that's not the land of Shinar. That's Saudi Arabia. That's not... Mesopotamia. So, when you get to looking at this really carefully, because people don't talk about it, nobody's ever mentioned it. And I wonder why. Because once you get this, it'll blow your mind. It'll explain what the book of Revelation is talking about, the mother of the harlots, who is Jerusalem, and why she's called Babylon. Because it's her place. She's gonna, They're going to build her a place in Babylon. And who is it? The woman is Jerusalem. So Jerusalem was destroyed, but she gets another place to live. She's going to live in Babylon. Now, when did that ever happen? Well, the Judeans were taken captive into Babylon. And yes, 70 years later, they were told they could go back. But what's interesting is they were told they were going to go back by Cyrus. He was a Persian king. Well, it's always very odd. I mean, there's another chapter in Isaiah that talks about having an eagle come along and take one of the tender branches of the cedar tree, which is a high royal bloodline, and taking it to a land of traffic, even to the land of Babylon. And this will be like, what, now the third time that we will show in a matter of just a few minutes here in this video an interpretation of the Bible has never been understood before. No one's ever told you this. And yet we're going to show you three different prophecies. The one in Hosea, the mother of the harlots, and who that is. And then Zechariah, the woman of wickedness. And there in Ezekiel, where the eagle comes and takes the tender branch into the land of traffic or the land of Babylon. All of them are talking about the transfer of the Jerusalem and the authority of that Yahwehism to Babylon. And not one soul up until now, and you'd have to ask, why in the world are we the only ones able to see this at this juncture? Probably because it's about to be fulfilled, friends. We need to know it now. I haven't been able to understand this the entire 2,000 years that's been going on. So there again... All the prophets seem to have the same story, but nobody really understands or even pays much attention to some of these things. So what is this little tender branch? Well, remember, Christ was the branch. And who is he a branch of? Well, the royal bloodline. And, and, and that's what this is talking about here because it we just, in chapter 4 of Zacharias, talking about these two anointed ones, two branches of the olive tree. So we're talking about the branch or the holy lineal descendant of the kings and the priests. And Ezekiel says uh, in chapter 17 that an eagle comes along and takes from, takes from the tree a branch and takes it to the land of traffic, which is Babylon. So that's what this is talking about.
But it also says, will it have success? No, because I will take another branch and it will be taken to the mountains of Israel. Why are there more than one mountains of Israel? Right, because at this point, Israel's been scattered to all the world and it's got different locations where each of the tribes have settled. And this is all the nations. And this is something that's completely been oblivious to most commentators and, and interpreters. They don't understand that Israel is now in all the world and they became the rulers of the world. And we've talked about how branches went to Europe and branches went here and branches went there. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. But primarily, we want to get to the point or to the bottom of the fact that Jerusalem is Babylon or the, the mother of the harlots that we're, that we're reading about in the book of Revelation and Zechariah. So, if you'll do any research, you'll see that after the Jewish people went back to their land with the decree by Cyrus in 539 to go back to the land, only a very few, well, I mean, you know, some thousands went back. So they were the children of the exile that came and returned. And they settled there. And in, in the days of Jesus, we, we see this whole story about King Herod's temple. We've talked also about the fact that they built another Jerusalem at Heliopolis. And this is recorded by Josephus and all the other history books. So there was another group. And that's where the Zadokite priesthood was where John was preaching. But we're talking about Herod's temple, where Jesus did go and they accused him by their law. Now, what law were they using? Well, it's the Talmudic law. And the Talmud was written in Babylon, the Babylonian Talmud. And Christians today are very unfamiliar with all of this. They don't realize that the Talmud is what they go by. It is law. It is not, they don't just go by the Torah because nobody understands or can interpret the Torah, but they're powerful rabbis that they look up to like, almost like gods, you know? And so what the rabbis say stands. You can go to the Torah and say, I believe this and I'm not guilty because the law says, and they're like, well, we don't care what the law says. We only care about what these rabbis have said in the Talmud about the law. And so now I'll show you maybe a little bit, I'll put some links in the um, info box so you can read all of this and study it out yourself. And I'm just kind of, kind of go over it, what you would read if you were to go to those links. But what happened was, is that there was a, a, a council of men, of rabbis, that kind of made that were like an authority that, that ruled and had the preeminence, the priesthood. And there was one that eventually ended up there in Jerusalem at Herod's temple. And there was another group that was in Babylon because most of the Jews didn't go to Jerusalem. They stayed in Babylon and Baghdad area and all around that area. And they were treated very fairly and, and, and they, had thousands of people there, like about over a million people in their society. They became more respected. Their teachings became more respected and they began to govern all of Judaism all around the world. Not the Jews there at Herod's temple. They didn't have the authority. The authority remained at Babylon. This is something Christians do not understand. The Babylonian Talmud is the authority for all Jews around the world and has been since the days of Christ. So they did indeed build a house or a priesthood. And in fact, they had buildings and, and administrative buildings and so forth there. And we're going to find that that is indeed the land of Shinar. And that indeed is what the, the, the Bible is talking about because she reigns over the kings of the earth. She's a, a, a strange woman because, or city or covenant. She's wickedness. But she's not the kings of the earth. Okay? She didn't rule the world. She did, there wasn't a, a Jewish empire that reigned over the world from Babylon, but there was. 
It wasn't a kingdom that, that was another beast that reigned over the other beasts. It was a woman, a covenant. And the covenant was this harlot. And to the Judeans, she was a harlot. And that's what they believed her to be. So here's one of the things I will put in the info box you can look at. Ancient Jewish history, the Babylonian Jewish community. And it just talks about there was a group of Jews who never left the Babylonian after the Babylonian exile in the 6th century BCE. This community more or less thrived, living since 129 BCE under the Parthian rule, a loosely knit semi-feudal state. It was able to develop its autonomous institutions with little interference from the royal government. The Parthians, who always feared Roman intervention, welcomed Jewish opposition to Rome, at least until the time of Hadrian. And you can read all the way down. They had, they had over... 800,000 to 1,200,000, well-based economically, comprising a fair number of farmers, many traders, who grew rich as intermediaries in the profitable silk trade between China and the Roman Empire passing through Babylonia. They had their own markets, talked about they were devout Zoroastrians, who talks about the Sassanids conquered the Parthians, and they were Zoroastrians. Uh, you can read lots of stuff about how the Babylonian Talmud got mixed up with a lot of Zoroastrian ideas and heaven and hell and different things that the Judeans up to that point, some say, didn't believe in. Well, I, that's a little debatable, but there's a lot of, you know, Judeans who believe that the Judean people became corrupt because they started being influenced by Zoroastrianism. I'm not inclined to believe that. I'm inclined to believe that they got in influenced by the Babylonian uh, law of Hammurabi and insisted upon this law and this court. And I think a lot of what they teach isn't really the Zoroastrian, which would probably be better. But what they got involved with was this law and war and the carnal commandments, which, which caused the world great harm with warfare and all of this. And because they then made a covenant, which had a reign over the kings of the earth, all the kings of the world, around the world, began to be ruled by these ideas coming from Babylon, which were really Judeans. And we'll show you that. Now, if you go, if you look up the legal academies that came out of that area in Babylon, just here in uh, the Goggle Brothers, they say, yes, the legal academies in Babylonia from the 4th to the 6th centuries, became the authoritative centers of Judaism in the Jewish world. These academies, also known as the Geonic Academies, were the center of Jewish scholarship and the development of Halakha from roughly 589 to 1038 CE. So this developed for centuries. Zechariah and Revelation is a prophecy that the Jews would then take over the world, reigning over the kings of the earth, and their headquarters would be the Babylon area. And this is exactly what happened. So it says that the, the presidents of the academies were known as the genoam, which is the plural of geon, meaning the pride or splendor. In biblical Hebrew, the genome were considered the highest authorities on religious matters in the Jewish world. The Babylonian Talmud is the second and more authoritative of the two Talmuds produced within Rabbinic Judaism. It was completed around 600 CE and served as a constitution and bylaws of Rabbinic Judaism. Friends, this isn't a religion. This is a constitution. This is a kingdom. These laws are civil laws. You steal or you, even if you like, not so not just moral, but like dividing land and what to do with contracts. So this is what became contract law and the basis of all law that is now at the bar in London. So this is what rules the world. This constitution, which is the old covenant, it's based on the Torah, all of it. The 613 laws, six and three is nine and one is 10. So it's no matter how many laws they make, from 10 to 613 to a million, or a gazillion in all the world, they're all precedent based on the Torah. 
So today, Judaism that's in Israel or anywhere else in the world is run by this Babylonian Talmud. And by the way, there's still vast numbers of Judeans that live there at Baghdad. <clears throat> and it spread not only through their literature and their laws and their Babylonian Talmud, but these concepts of an eye for an eye and war and all of this spread around the world. And more than that, the literal king of Jeconiah, one of the princes, was taken to various places in Europe. And all the royal blood of Europe is from the line of David. And we'll show you that here in a minute. Now, here's something interesting that someone writes. It says, one development of great concern was that of the Talmud, which is based on a diversion away from the Torah to the thoughts of great, in parentheses, men. The Talmud is diametrically opposed to the spirit of the Torah and appears to be the basis of the conversion of the Khazar Empire to the north of Persia on the north and east of the Black Sea, whose descendants make up to 80, 90 percent of those officially regarded as Jews today. It appears that these Khazars dominate the state of Israel, which was not founded according to the Torah specifics or what the prophet said. But it seems that the Khazars came in contact with Talmudic Jews from Persia. Now, here's an article that I want you to see if you're interested in looking this up. I'm going to have a link for this about Charlemagne. We've talked about that. I've told you guys in the past that Charlemagne brought a prince of the line of Jeconiah from Baghdad to Europe. Now, remember, Charlemagne is the guy who started the Holy Roman Empire. And his descendants, he had like 13 children that became all these different lines that went all around the world, you know, and ended up ruling the papacy as well as, you know, the French and the Spanish and the British. And, and, and they got mixed with some other Khazarians who were more Gothic. But all of them all around this whole area of the world were all descendants of Israel in one way or the other. And this just talks about how Charlemagne, king of the Franks from 768, emperor of the West from 800, Charlemagne was well disposed toward the Jews. A Jew, Isaac, was a member, probably interpreter, of the delegation he sent to the caliph Harun al-Rashid. He was the only one to return from Baghdad and brought back an elephant Rashid's gift to the emperor. Charlemagne also had dealings with Jewish merchants, especially with an expert in jewelry. Some of his legal provisions were clearly influenced by the theological issues of the day. He forbade the Jews to employ Christians to work on Sundays and Christian festivals and warned against the sale of church property to the Jews. And it goes on and on and talks about how he, he, he loved the Jews and that there was this, now look at this, where it says, the legendary tales which flourished immediately after his death and gained greater currency from the 12th century on extol Charlemagne's friendship for the Jews and make special mention of his appointment of a Nazi. <laughs> <coughs> what? A Jewish king in Narborn. Huh. Okay. They credit him with giving the Jews of that city special rights in recognition of their support when Narbonne was taken from the Muslims. Now, what they don't really tell you there, because it was hidden for a thousand years now. We, we, we haven't had a lot of information. Since then, now, in modern times, we've got Dan Brown talking about, you know, the Merovingian line and the, uh, the line of Clovis and, and the Plantagen line and so forth. And he, he traces this back to the lineal descendant of King David. So there's a little bit of this going around today, but what, what we found and these modern scholars are finding is that this was all covered over. And you'll see why if you read this book, it's a Jewish princedom in feudal France. And that's what the name of the book is, Jewish princedom in feudal France. Well, it says, and this, this guy who wrote the book is Zuckerman. Well, it's a little bit like the Zuckerbergs that run the Facebook, if you know what I mean. According to 
Zuckerman's thesis, a vassal Jewish princedom was established in Narbo and Septimania by the Carolinian king Pepin as a reward for Jewish cooperation. Well, this is a long article and we're not going to talk, we're not going to read the whole thing. It does talk about the Merovinians and the, you know, the Davidic line that goes all the way through the entire world and ends up in Britain and so forth. They end up with basically these, they're, 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 like I said, there are several branches of these lines. I believe that one branch was reigning in Italy and maybe Germany with the Khazars. There's another branch that's down into the area around France and Spain. Now, we, we, we've we talked about the line of Jesus and Mary Magdalene that went to the area of southern France, which is called the Languedoc, and they had a big kingdom there. Well, they had lineal descendants of Jesus Christ, and they didn't like that because they didn't really believe in Judaism. They believed in Christianity. And so... When the Holy Roman Empire was becoming the ruling power, they had to defeat this concept that we had a line of Jesus who could reign over the world. Certain ones were claiming this. So they had a lot of wars with these individuals down in the Languedoc. This is the reason why we had the Inquisition of the Waldensians and the Spanish Inquisition, because they pushed them over to Spain, they pushed them all the way up to that northern northwestern tip of france which became breton and then when they eventually drove them all the way out we've got columbus that sailed over here we've got the scottish that sailed over here well they weren't just the scottish they were these individuals that were being rooted out and murdered by another side who hated these guys. And why did they hate them? Because they were the Christian individuals who were from Israel. We're all from Israel. Everybody in the world is one of the tribes of Israel. And they removed that idea from the minds and, and even hid the idea that they were the Judeans. M many of them began to teach a more of a hidden message. And they began to teach a doctrine against Christianity. And it was their rabbis who invented a language that they call Hebrew, you know, thousands of years after they ever spoke it. It was a dead language. Nobody even thinks it ever existed. But they wanted some sort of superiority. They wanted proof that they were the true line. We should follow them. And what they wanted, these Judeans, was to go back to the law. And they didn't want Jesus. They didn't like Jesus. So in their translations of the Bible, which is what most of our translations are today, other than Septuagint, they throw out these ideas like the virgin birth and that Jesus was divine and all of this and obscure the prophecies in the Old Testament by their fake language. And this is the lying pen of the scribe. So these are the two individuals groups that were fighting. They were got, we've got the Christians who were protecting the Holy Grail or the holy bloodline of Christ, protecting the holy textus receptus, which is the Septuagint, and creating the charities and the libraries and constitutions of freedom and justice for all that eventually came to America and made the Constitution. But we've got the other group that were constantly warring and military and murder, and they eventually quit the military as the sole means of destroying them because it seemed like their blood was just seed for this Christian Protestant new religion. So what they did was they infiltrated their organizations and took over, once they would drive them out, they would like take over and then start teaching the opposite and divert everything back to Judaism and obscure the lines of love and grace and law and order. They did that in France and, and Spain. And so Columbus being one of these uh, Jews from the Goths that was sent down there to destroy the Languedoc, 
So Charlemagne went to Baghdad and got a royal bloodline from Jeconiah. He married his aunt, and that made one of these lineal descendants that ruled after he died. Charlemagne himself, though, probably married a a into that line, or somehow they're, they're, it's very difficult to sort this all out. But Charlemagne being so uh, good to the Judeans, and all of his children being named after these Judean names and all of these lineages and stuff, we can divine that the whole thing from Charlemagne down was a, a line from King David. In fact, Charlemagne always wanted to be called David. That's what he, he I, I don't know, that was his title, David. And then his son was called Isaac. They always use these particular code names. It's odd. My father's name is Charles. David Charles. And his brother is a Frank. And they named me David. So this is a tradition of people who was born from Europe in that area. Uh, my ancestry goes back to this exact area. So this was an attempt successfully for most of the world history but it won't be successful in the end but they would that they tried to do was obscure the idea of the lineage of christ and get rid of the idea of judeans and just secretly take over the world and so they introduced the goths from the northern area which were the holy roman germanic tribes they believed in Judaism too, the Kazarians and so forth. But it was this law. It was this vengeance. It wasn't believing in the Lord. It was the believing in this devil. They turned the, 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 the moral fabric and the, and the history and the beliefs into this other carnal commandments and genocide and hate and all of this. And they were trying to stamp out this grace and love from Christ. So the Holy Roman Empire was the Pope became the line of the popes. And they were then ruled over by lineal descendants from Jews from Baghdad. And they took and put these royal descendants in all the world, as we've said. It seems that they brought another lineal descendant, either another one or it's the same one, but there's discrepancies as to who actually married who and stuff. Because they had tried to hide all of this for years. You can read this article here and see this Davidic lineage from Baghdad by Pepin and his son Charlemagne. And so it one of the lines was the Theodoric line and the Plantagen line and the Pepin the Bald and, and so forth. But all of this goes down to Henry the the eighth I am I am you know and the world empire then in Britain which became Queen Victoria and then Queen Elizabeth and then today King Charles who has lineal descendant back to Vlad the Impaler which is what we know today as the vampire or Count Dracula. And that was a lineal descendant of the house of David. Now, as we've talked about before, when kings of royal blood come along, the highest of the kings would be the one of the kings who would have the most bloodlines. He could trace his line back through more family lines. So the bloodlines were all around the world. The czars, the Khazars, the Caesars, the Nebuchadnezzars, and all the czars and, and bloodlines of the world that we know about. There's a lot more that we don't know about. And the European bloodlines, the Merovingian line and all this was Judean. But it wasn't from Christ. They stamped that line out. And that line was Waldo, Peter Waldo, Pierre Valdez, some, some translations, or Percy Val. He's come down to us with different names, but it's the same person. And that was a line that went and eventually came to America. And these, these were the good guys. And they had a priesthood of love and grace and they didn't care about ruling or they didn't care about their name. They cared about getting the gospel to the world. So this is what we have here, friends. This kingdom or the covenant, this woman, the 
covenant of Judea, which is the scroll that's flying around and the curse is landing on all of us, from which the four horses began to go forth, war and death and famine and pestilence. This is all from the law of Moses. Yahweh brought the plagues. And this is wickedness. And the house that was built for it is symbolically Babylon, which is confusion. Not Babel, by the way. Babel is the house of, or the gate of El. And they were trying to find knowledge and wisdom when Yahweh, this confusion, came along and confused the language. So, you know, this has been going on in cycles. People go back to the law, and then it confuses the whole mess. We don't try to find the divine being, or we, or in the process of trying to define the divine being, to have knowledge to become like deity, well, we've got to go through the duality and we've got to learn by the things in which we suffer. So, the world, you can use this to understand a little bit more about Europe. Now, most people when they're reading history or even the Bible or anything, they don't realize why is all of this going on. Where are these people evil? What are they trying to do? Well, they are completely deceived. Satan has deceived the entire inhabited world. And they literally believe in this old covenant. Why? Because they're blinded, Paul says. They went up to the Mount Horeb and the light shined and they said, Oh, veil that. We need a priesthood. You go talk to him, not, not us. We can't handle love and light. That's too much. We want vengeance. See, Moses didn't give you vengeance. You gave yourself vengeance. You demanded it. You wanted to go back to the meat pots of Egypt. You were lusting. You didn't like the milk and honey. But what we got was the curse and the bondage and death and the wrath or the judgment that's coming. And anyone who's in Christ, there is no condemnation. And we're not appointed under this wrath. We've talked about it being the Greek word orgy, which is a little bit more in-depth to understand than just wrath itself. The orgy is some kind of ceremony that the ten tribes or the northern tribes would carry out in remembrance. Now, the Judeans had their own festivals and so forth, but we know that these this particular holiday, holy day, isn't really from Judea as much as it is the Greeks because we've got the woman in the goblet and it's the wine of her wrath or the her it's the orgy goblet where they drank the wine and it caused the ecstatic behavior and there was a simple uh, ceremony that they would use and it had to do with remembering the great war where Zeus and the Olympians went down and battled the Titans and they were slashed and it was just wrathful. It was, it was a great battle. The war between light and darkness. The Essenes talked about the war of the sons of light and darkness. So the wrath is a war and it's a spiritual war because the truth or the light fights the darkness. The darkness might use weapons. They may use lies. They may use deception. They may use cannons or missiles. They might bring fire down from heaven, really. But the good guys don't do that. They don't know what kind of spirit they are from who does that real fire, right? That's not the kind of spirit we are. Well, our fire is, like Elijah, is to ask for the Lord to answer us and accept our love and our, our offering as a living sacrifice to all that we that are around us, even to the fact that we will go into the battle to save our loved ones. It was a great sacrifice that Jesus gave. He came and battled Satan and all the dominion of Satan, the principalities, powers, dominions, and lords and thrones. And this was in hell. In other words, he died. But he already overcame death, death and he said to his 144,000, the remnant at that time, it says, take up your cross and follow me. 
And you who drink this with me, this cup of wrath, I'm going to die, you'll reign with me. So we all in that first century, we were all there with him. We took up our crosses and we all followed him. And we were the first fruits, the congregation. And we're going to come back with Christ riding on white horses. We'll talk about that in more detail in other videos. We've already done a lot about that. But this great time of wrath is literally the battle. And for the people who are fighting for the darkness, they are literally unaware that they are following darkness. They're blind. That's what darkness is. They're blind, so they don't even know. It's not like you choose to follow darkness. Darkness is something you have, and darkness comes because of your blindness. And light is enlightenment, and it's something that you have when you receive the gospel, and you receive it with love. And those who receive the love of the truth that they might be saved is the salvation from the wrath that is coming. So, the book of Revelation is about this. The mark of the beast on your hand or your forehead is the law of Moses on your hand or your forehead, spoken of in Exodus and Deuteronomy. But the whole book of Revelation is a combination of the Judean laws and rituals and the nations. Because remember, the nations, all of them, are the ten tribes. They went into all the nations and they were sown like seed, Hosea says. And where it was said, you're not my people, there shall be the sons of the living deity. And so they became a great multitude. Who are these, my Lord? Well, you know, they are a great multitude who have come out of great tribulation and have washed their robes in the blood of the lamb. And they hunger no more, they thirst no more. And these are those who have come out of the great tribulation. These are the ones that, that Daniel's 70th week gets cut short or separated a space in between so that the gospel could go into the Gentiles. And when the Gentiles become in, then all Israel will be saved. This There's a lot of stuff that, that will go into this, but just covering it briefly, just to show you that, that this is all exactly what the book of Revelation, Zechariah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Daniel, all of them are talking about, is the two covenants. The old covenant, which brings bondage and a curse, that woman or that covenant, which is under this uh, bondage with her children, Hagar. And the other covenant, which is Sarah, who is the free woman. And that is Christ. And, and that is us. All of it. Zechariah and Revelation and everything else is talking about the old covenant that must go. We're not killing people. People are blind. They're ignorant. They don't know. They're little children who came out into the wilderness to see someone singing on a harp. No, they came out to see a prophet and I say one greater than a prophet. They came out to see John. There's never been born a woman, a man greater than John. And John was the leader of the worldwide Gentile Ten tribes worshipped at Bethel, the gate of El, who was up there in Syria, which is why Jesus told the Pharisees, was there no widows in Israel that Elijah, when the famine happened, the tribulation, he had to go to the widow of Zarephath, which is Beth house of Zerah. And that's the other line of Judah. And that's Samson who married Delilah. And they had this other priesthood that was using the priesthood of Elisha, Elijah's disciple. And that was the Lycinian Mysteries and the Temple of Artemis where they had the Essenes and the Sacrament and the Glossalia. And those were these Christians that were in that part called the Greeks. But there were others in, in, in Japan called Shintoism and in, in India called Hinduism, and Taoism in China and Zoroastrianism in Persia and all around the world. The lost tribes and their prophets who went to them, they'll be restored and their scriptures and we'll be able to see what the truth is when the restoration comes and we'll all see eye to eye when he brings back Zion. And then is fulfilled the prophecy to Joseph. He should become a, a father of a multitude of nations. 
No man can number. Every tribe, tongue, people. He had a coat of many colors. And it will switch then from Leah, Yah, the unfavorite wife, to the favorite wife, Ra'el, whose firstborn son was Joseph and got the promise. But Judah, not even the firstborn of Leah, one of the last born of Leah, that's the old covenant that we got first, but we should have got the first covenant, but we rejected it. So Jacob didn't get Ra'el, he got Leah. So we had to go through the lessons first. We had to go through the, the com carnal commandments before we got to the, the, the covenant of love. And the child that would be born of that union, which is spoken of there in Revelation chapter 12, is the kingdom of Christ, which is the promised seed of the true covenant of grace and love. And that's the covenant we're going to receive soon, friends. And Babylon, the mystery Babylon, written on that mother of the harlots, which is Jerusalem, who's under that curse, has gone forth into all the world. And she has a, a city which reigns over the kings of the earth. And that is Judaism, a religion, not a, not a race. We're all Jews. We're all Jews in heart. One who is on the inside, circumcised on the inside. And we're all going to be saved. Jesus said, I have not lost a one except the son of destruction that the scripture might be fulfilled. And that son of destruction is certainly the, the flesh. Okay, because the flesh is that Esau that the Lord hated. So that is the, the carnal nature which has to be redeemed and we're all, we've all got that carnal nature and we've got to redeem this body of flesh and give it wings. And Jesus did by raising that body up in three days. And this war that we're seeing that's about to erupt over there, according to the scripture, will be a great tribulation on the whole world. And it will be a, a battle and there probably will be literal battles in earth and in heaven. And the angels are probably right now throwing Satan out because the tribulation is about to begin. And when the devil comes down, woe into the earth for the sea. For the devil has come down into you having great wrath. And he goes after the woman and goes into the wilderness which is where we need to be. We need to get out of Babylon if you don't want to share where they're in her plagues. And that's something that we've never gotten out of. You see, Babylon, we're in it. A remnant of Israel or Judah went into Babylon and never came out. And they are the covenant that we're all following. And we've got to come out of that now in order that we might not partake of her plagues. And those plagues are coming soon. And those are the plagues that we will have no part in as long as we get out of Babylon. So anyway, we're going to leave it there. I'm going to go get this uploaded. I hope you guys have a wonderful evening. Lord will bless you and we'll see you tomorrow and have a good one.